Hey guys, welcome back to the show, and on this episode, I'm going to be talking about a movie that I truly hate, quite honestly. This is easily one of the worst movies I have ever seen, and I don't mean that in a so bad it's good sort of way. There's really nothing enjoyable about this thing. I fell asleep twice trying to watch this movie, which might actually be something the movie's got going for it because it's helped with my insomnia. So why did I choose to do a video on it? Well, I saw it as kind of a challenge to see if I could take the most boring movie I've ever seen and somehow make it entertaining for all of you. This movie is The Astro Zombies from 1968. And take a good look at this poster because this is the best thing about the movie and it's not even debatable. The movie starts with this woman driving home and like a lot of the scenes in this movie, this goes on for a very long time. Finally, she pulls into her garage when suddenly a person wearing some kind of a mask attacks and kills her with a gardening tool. Now you may be thinking, ooh, this seems like the start of an interesting mystery. It's not. Don't be fooled. The rest of this movie is just as stupid as this opening credit sequence, which is just footage of a bunch of toys. This has nothing to do with the story. I think they're trying to make the connection between the toys and the Astro Zombies. It just doesn't really make sense. Now we see a horrible car accident, which in my opinion is clearly a case of distracted driving. Looks to me like this guy was trying to drive and open a can of red paint at the same time, which is something you should never do. I know it's tempting, but do you want to end up like this guy? I mean, look, the car is totaled, and now he's going to have to pay for a brand new can of paint. That's not going to be cheap. But what caused the accident? Who knows and who cares? All that matters is this guy, who I guess saw the accident. He drags the man's body away, and then we have this whip cut. Did you see that? Get used to it, because they put these between the vast majority of the scenes in this movie. And I don't know why. I can only imagine the reason is to make the movie feel like things are happening, you know, there's action, things are moving at a good pace, which couldn't be further from the truth. So now we're in a car where some guy named Sergio is rewinding some tape on a reel, and once again, this goes on for a really long time. Wow, this is so exciting. Look, an overpass. And now we're in, I don't know, I guess the CIA, and they're doing some sort of an investigation into a scientist named Dr. DeMarco. It turns out they had an undercover agent working as a lab partner with the scientist who worked with Dr. DeMarco when he was fired from the Aerospace Research Center. Well, it turns out DeMarco was working on some pretty crazy stuff, like mechanical hearts and thought wave transmission. So the CIA is like, hey, we can't let that technology get into the hands of foreign governments. Now, you may be wondering what thought wave transmission is. Well, you are in luck, because there is a brain on the table right there, and Dr. Petrovich is going to demonstrate. Yeah, see, the brain is shaking, which means that uh, information is going into the brain through these wires. That's what happens when you go to school. Your brain just shakes all day. So what you're saying is, Doctor, that one man's thoughts can be transmitted to another man's brain and that man will respond to it? Exactly. Seems pretty simple. It's like jumping a car battery. You know, you just put the two clamps on there and just fire it up. The benefit of this is you don't have to match up the colors, like red to black, I don't think that matters. You can just put it anywhere on the brain. See, the brain really isn't as complicated as scientists make it out to be. This is pretty straightforward. Let's say you're out somewhere with a group of friends and you wanna communicate with your buddy without anyone else knowing what the two of you are communicating about. Well, you just jam two wires into your head and two wires into their head and you can read each other's thoughts. But even though this looks simple enough, do not try this at home. You are going to get blood all over the place. Go to your friend's house. So Dr. Petrovich says this way, they can transmit the knowledge of smart people into the mind of a quasi-man during a space flight. Quasi-man? You mean a, a sort of a zombie? Yes, so here's the plan. We take body parts from different people and mix and match them, kind of like a Mr. Potato Head situation, and then we launch that corpse cadet into space and just send signals to their brain telling them what to do. 
Sounds like a pretty foolproof plan if you ask me. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? I mean, could you develop a computer to do the same thing? Maybe, but that's not nearly as fun as firing a zombie up there in a rocket. Like, how cool does that sound? So the one agent is like, hey, if DeMarco's experiments are so advanced, then why was he fired? And they tell him that basically DeMarco was experimenting on live patients instead of cadavers. I'm just wondering, how did that happen? Like, what was the context? Did a pilot go to this doctor complaining because they had a headache, and then the next minute they woke up missing some organs? And it just sounds like a serious crime was committed by this guy. So I'm just kind of curious as to why, you know, he wasn't taken into custody as soon as he did these things. I mean, yes, I don't know the exact situation, but it just seems kind of funny to me. Did somebody complain about him? Like, hey, this guy took out my kidney and replaced it with a sponge. And HR was just kind of like, well, it's kind of your word against his, but... I'll tell you what, we will fire him, and that should resolve the situation. So now they're talking about how over the past six months, all these murders have been taking place, and it's probably not a coincidence. Wow, big brain time over there. Then Chuck says that based on his leads, the meeting is happening tonight at a nightclub. All right, looks like the nightclub's meeting place. I should get some useful information. What's this meeting about? We don't know. Who's going to this meeting? We don't know. Anyways, now we're at the nightclub where this guy, Sergio, sells the tape he was rewinding in the car to these two people, Satana and Juan. But Sergio isn't going to sell it for the agreed upon price. Who are you? Anyways, Sergio still has the balls to demand double the price for the tape. Meanwhile, some guy attacks his chauffeur outside and steals his chauffeur's outfit. Not sure where he's planning on hiding the naked body, though. So Sergio goes outside and gets quite the surprise. <laughs> Anyways, now we're in the lab of Dr. DeMarco. And this is like some Dr. Frankenstein shit. Just look at this. It looks like it's in some sort of a castle. He's got a hunched over assistant. The only difference is his name is Francho instead of Igor. So they get the dead guy from the car accident and they take a desk lamp shade and put it on his head. The thing is, you may be sitting there thinking, okay, well, here's where things start happening. You know, this is when it gets good, right? No, it doesn't. It gets progressively more boring, and I don't even know how that's possible. I mean, you got a scene with a dead body lying on a table with some thing on its head, and the doctor says, okay, it's time to start the extraction. You'd think, okay, here we go. You know, there's maybe some sparks start flying. He lets out a maniacal laugh. No, none of it. I'm telling you right now, it's not happening. I am going to show you right now what happens. Prepare to be underwhelmed and kind of pissed off. He pulls out a screwdriver, opens this box, and this takes forever, by the way. I've edited this footage. Throws a circuit board in this box, tightens all the screws. For the love of God, cut some of this out. He flicks a few switches, and then he does the whole thing. Again! Then he starts going into all these specific details about everything he is doing. And you might be thinking, well, what's wrong with that? Well, I'll tell you what's wrong with that. A general overview of what's happening? Totally fine. In fact, I would expect that. But this goes on and on forever about shit we don't need to hear. We must be sure of total degaussing of the circuits. I don't care that you have to degauss the circuits. I don't care that you now have to put the circuit into the programmer and set it for, oh wait, what is it? Exactly 10 and 2 tenths seconds. No one is watching this going, oh my God, 20,000 volts and 500,000 cycles instead of 400,000 cycles? I am just so much more invested now. He's really pushing the envelope. Unless maybe you're an electrician, I don't know. Okay, so blah, 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 now they go over to the dead body and I guess they want to exchange all of his blood and replace it with something and once again, is any of this edited to speed it up a little? No, it just continues to be some of the most boring science fiction I've ever seen in my life. And even after they start exchanging the blood, which as you might have guessed, goes on forever, 
I don't even know what this is supposed to be. Was this guy filled with Kool-Aid? This really doesn't look like blood. It just looks like the experiment ended with a jug full of Sharkleberry Finn. Which, quite honestly, isn't a complete failure because that can be very refreshing, especially after a long summer day when you've been jumping through the sprinkler all afternoon. Okay, so now they put him into, I don't know, some kind of a fridge. And after another whip cut, we're in Dr. Petrovich's lab where they are having fun with food coloring. Eric, the undercover agent, is, I guess, dating one of the lab assistants. They leave and then Dr. Petrovich does the same, which leaves his assistant behind. And then suddenly she's attacked and killed by the Astro Zombie. How did he get in? Who knows? Uh, am I wrong for assuming that you might need some sort of a key at some point to get into the Aerospace Research Center laboratory? Meanwhile, Satana is listening to the tape, which is a recording of DeMarco explaining how he conducts his experiments. Think about how boring it was to watch it. Now imagine listening to that on tape. She's probably sitting there realizing that she had a man killed in order to get her hands on the most boring audiobook of all time. Anyways, the agents are at the nightclub and Juan and the other henchmen are spying on them. And then he calls Satana and tells her that the lab assistant is there and she tells him to only watch them. And at the same time, I think the CIA is listening in on the phone call. Are you following any of this? Do you know what's going on? So the one agent walks outside and just to be clear, this is supposed to take place at night. They shot day for night for pretty much every night scene in this movie. Obviously it doesn't look like nighttime because they shot on a sunny day, but that's okay because they just put the sound of crickets over all the night scenes so that there's no doubt when it's taking place. Okay, now that I think about it, it's actually hilariously appropriate to have the sound of crickets running throughout this movie. In fact, that should be the soundtrack to the movie. That should be the soundtrack to me watching the movie. Now, Satana lights a cigarette and it feels like the movie wants me to be in suspense about something, but I don't know what that is. And then it goes right to the agents playing bar tricks and having fun, which feels really out of place because then the movie goes right back to suspenseful music and shots of agents with radios and guns listening into, I have no idea. Have you ever watched a movie where you stop paying attention for a minute and then suddenly realized you're completely lost, like you have no idea what's going on? Well, with this movie, you can pay attention the entire time and still feel like that. Oh no, there's a car coming into an underground parking garage. You better watch out because, again, I don't know. I don't know what these agents are trying to do exactly. So it's Juan and the other henchman, I think his name is Tiros, and they miss the one agent because he hides in this doorway. But they find the other agent with the walkie-talkie and bring him into the house where they rough him up and Satana shoots him. Satana, Satana, I don't care. She tells them to get rid of the body, and once again, they somehow don't see the other agent as they walk by. I don't even know how that's possible from that angle, but okay. Somehow, this movie even manages to make a gunfight boring. It's truly a sight to miss. But there is one part I should show you. This is probably the most interesting part of this fight. The funniest part about this whole thing is when you remember that this entire scene is supposed to take place at night. Satana shoots the other agent and oh my god, this might actually be interesting if only we knew just what the hell is actually going on. Who these people are, why the agents are spying on them, you know, the context. But now we're back in the lab of ambiguity. What's DeMarco doing here? I don't know. He's turning these wheels while he's got this lady strapped down. Who is she? How did she get there? And what happened to her in the end are all questions that you will never get answers to, so you might as well abandon all hope now. DeMarco shows Francho how he's got a heart that's running on solar power, which is fine, but then? We sit and watch a bunch of nothing for a while. Ooh, wow, he's fooling around with some components. For the love of God, do something. Honestly, I could just go on and on. All of this, it's just like, oh, I'm gonna go over here and plug this in. 
Well, now I'm gonna stand here and look at stuff for a while. Back at the CIA, they're talking about how the agents who disappeared were onto something. Not many leads, but what we've got is interesting. Yeah, you know what? Something tells me we have very different definitions of interesting. Uh, it's my fault. I should have been there with Mike. Uh, wait, Chuck. You can't be all things to all people. You can't blame yourself. Oh, sorry to interject, but the two of you went to the club to pick up information, right? And instead, you spent the whole time drinking and having fun. The bad guys, they actually spotted you. You got made. They were the ones picking up information on you. So, uh, sorry, I know that I'm new here, but just correct me if I'm wrong, that just seems like the exact opposite of what we're trying to accomplish. Anyways, they have a dossier on Sergio outlining his entire history, and they're like, hey, look, Sergio was at this astro science conference two weeks before DeMarco was fired. So there you go, he must be involved somehow. So now we're back with these people listening to the DeMarco tape. We are now almost an hour into this movie, and we still have no idea what their motives are, what they're trying to accomplish. It seems our Dr. DeMarco has succeeded in creating a subservient zombie. This is something my government must have. Okay, so there it is. Her government, whichever government that is, wants a zombie. It's really starting to make sense, you know? It's all coming together now. So Juan is like, hey, if we get an RF directional finder, we can track the transmission back to DeMarco's lab and find DeMarco. Oh my God, it's so simple. Quick, to Radio Shack. But believe it or not, it gets even better, guys. And by better, I mean worse. See, Janine used to be DeMarco's lab assistant, and she saw a guy die in the hospital when she and DeMarco rushed over there to take the organs and freeze them. So if DeMarco is using that guy's brain in the Astro Man, it makes sense why the Astro Man went to the lab and killed Lynn, because the Astro Man was really looking for Janine, because... That's right, she was the last person that he saw before he died. And he wants to murder the last person that he saw. Duh! So they come up with a plan to lure the Astro Man back to the lab by using her as bait, because this all makes total sense. Meanwhile, the, I don't know, I'm just gonna call them spies at this point. The spies went out and got their RF directional finder, and apparently picked up a new hat for Juan along the way. So they decide to drive around the city with this thing, and that will lead them to the lab. Meanwhile, back at the lab, DeMarco is pressing buttons and talking about stuff that really makes no difference to the audience, because of course he is. I've introduced him to the console, the electrolytic limiters. And then finally he's like, all right, prepare one of the bodies for a total brain transplant or whatever, who cares. Back at the other lab, they're getting Janine ready to act as bait for the Astro Man, and in order to do that, she's got to look busy. Now this is important. You've got to show yourself out this window every now and then. Why? Why now and then? Why not just open the window completely? Wave your arms around. You're trying to lure in a zombie. Well, what, you're afraid the zombie with the defective brain is gonna be able to tell that it's a sting if it's too obvious? Pardon me for being nosy, but uh, where do you suppose he'll come in? Yes, I'm sorry. I know it's very nosy of me to want to know which entrance the radio-controlled killing machine is most likely to use to come in and try and murder me. So now Janine has just got to sit there and wait. Yep, just her and a brain in a jar. While the agents wait outside for some reason, why couldn't they just wait inside? Wouldn't that be safer? Just stay away from the window, hide under a desk or something if you're that worried about it. Once again, she's just sitting there waiting, and this goes on forever. The worst part of it is, it's not suspenseful because it's so stupid. Doesn't look like it's gonna work, huh? Mm. So, after all of that, nothing! Just a total waste of time! And what was the logic behind this? Oh, he's killed someone here before, so he's bound to do it again. Let's just have her sit here for 10 minutes at some random point during the night, because he's gotta come back. As if the zombie is just wandering around the building, checking in every few minutes. So Eric takes her home. Keep in mind, this is supposed to be nighttime, based on the sound of the crickets again. 
until they find out the lights aren't working inside of her apartment, and he leaves to go check the fuse box. And just look at this. This may be the dumbest shot of the entire movie. How are you going to create the suspense of the lights not working in the dead of night when the sun is so clearly beaming down on everything? Eric even leaves at one point to go get a flashlight because, ah, oh, it must be so hard to see. The porch light overhead just isn't bright enough. Janine is inside and keeps checking the lights, but they don't work. Oh god, this is so dangerous with all that daylight pouring in through the windows. Suddenly, the Astro Man just appears. He's been in the room the whole time. And honestly, guys, this movie is just exhausting at this point. I mean, how the hell did he know where she lived? And how does he manage to just keep getting into all these places? Meanwhile, Eric is still inspecting the light like, Oh, wait, what was that? Was that screaming I heard? Finally, he clues in like, Oh, right, the murderous zombie. So he runs to help her, but the zombie throws him into the closet door, grabs the flashlight, and runs away. And why did the zombie grab the flashlight? Because its power cell fell off during the struggle, and it needs solar power or another source of light to keep its heart going. That's why the zombie is running around with a flashlight on its head, because there's clearly no sunlight outside. It's the middle of the night, remember? Crickets! So the spies arrive at the lab, and the one spy, Tiros, is like, Ha ha ha, I'm gonna betray both of you now, because other governments will pay me more money to know where the lab is. But he wasn't expecting Satana to kick the gun out of his hand, the ultimate way to disarm someone. So they kill him, and then just walk right into the house and down into the lab. I guess doors with locks just don't exist in this universe. They come down there like, hey, we want your knowledge. And he's like, all right, I'll tell you everything I'm doing. But that's when the other Astro Zombie comes back. And then the CIA and the cops just show up. How do they know where the lab is? Who knows and who cares? It's not like anything has made any sense up to this point anyways. So then, who is this again? Chuck, Eric, whatever. He just walks into the lab because that's a good idea. Go into the house alone where a mad scientist is creating killing machines. Juan is more than happy to have a very awkward looking fight with Francho. And the Astro Man is like, give me my machete and chases him out of there. Everybody starts shooting. For some reason, nobody runs away from the Astro Man, and then, I don't know, DeMarco destroys it. Satana tells the new Astro Man to kill the agents, but I guess since he's so morally pure, he decides to kill her instead. Or maybe he just doesn't like being told what to do. Like I said, I hate this movie, and I'm not alone. Leonard Maltin said that this was another nominee for the worst picture of all time. And even TV Guide says it is one of the all-time worst sci-fi pictures. Now, obviously, I do not recommend watching this movie. It's extremely difficult to get through. It's unbelievably bad. It's incredibly boring. And it's very weird. So on that note, that's pretty much it for this one. As usual, thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you all next time. Okay, I just want to be clear on this. So I could go out on a mission, let's say a stakeout, right? I could spend the whole time drinking, eating pizza, screwing around, basically doing anything but what I should be doing. I would get a pat on the back for that. That just seems like the standard. I'm not criticizing, I just want to know how low does the bar actually go? I am not joking, I'm not exaggerating, this is... It's, I don't even know how to describe it. It's on a level of frustrating and boring that I haven't seen in a very long time. It's totally different when it's Igor, set it to 100,000 volts, flick the switch. Not when you're like, okay, I am now going to degauss the circuits and then show it for five minutes. Okay, I'm gonna uh, put the circuit into the programmer now and I'm gonna set it for exactly 10 and 2 tenths seconds. And now, we're gonna set it for 20,000 volts and 500,000 cycles. Isn't this intense? Are you, ex are you getting excited?